Uh, the president has very deep-seated views on these issues, particularly on matters related to trade and allies. Indeed, if you were living here in Boston on September 2nd, 1987, and uh, you had read your copy of the Boston Globe very carefully, you would have come across a letter to the American people from a then relatively unknown uh, Manhattan real estate developer. Uh, it turned out that that letter to the American people read like a rough draft of Donald Trump's 2016 uh, presidential campaign platform. So I am very happy to introduce Evo Dalder, who is president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, he was U.S. ambassador to NATO from 2009 to 2013. Um, before that, he was senior fellow in foreign policy studies at, the, at Brookings, specializing in American foreign policy, European security and transatlantic relations, and national security affairs. Uh, before joining Brookings, he was associate professor at Maryland School of Public Policy and director of research at its Center for International Security Studies. He also served as director for European Affairs on Clinton's National Security, security Council staff. He has uh, authored and edited 10 books. Interestingly, one of them uh, was also with Jim Lindsay, uh, the award-winning America Unbound, the Bush Revolution in Foreign Policy. I will not go on with all the qualifi qualifications and accolades, but I will note the local connection. He earned his PhD here uh, at MIT. So welcome back to town. Uh, James Lindsay is Senior Vice President and Director of Studies and Maurice R. Greenberg Chair at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he oversees the work of more than six dozen fellows in the David Rockefeller Studies Program. He is a leading authority on the American foreign policy making process and the domestic politics of American foreign policy. Uh, before returning to CFR in 2009, Jim was the inaugural director of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law at the University of Texas, where he held the Tom Slick Chair for International Affairs at the Johnson School of Public Affairs. Uh, from 2003 to 2006, he was Vice President, Director of Studies, and Maurice R. Greenberg Chair at CFR. He previously served as Deputy Director and Senior Fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies Program at Brookings. Um, and uh, Jim and Evo shared an office um, in their 20s. So this goes way back, not just the previous book. Again, I won't go on with all the amazing qualifications, but I will note that uh, Jim is a very uh, passionate member of Red Sox Nation. Um, and Go Sox. <laughs> uh, World champion. Oh, okay. um, so passionate that he does not even watch the games. Uh, and he's from Winchester. So um, with that, uh, well, please welcome our speakers. So let me just sort of uh, talk about our book, uh, The Empty Throne in America's Abdication of Global Leadership, by telling the story uh, of something that happened on July 21st, 2017. President Donald Trump leaves the White House, goes in a motorcade, across the Potomac River to the Pentagon for a briefing in a place called The Tank. That's the name given to the top secret meeting room of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It's in the outer ring of the Pentagon. It's one of the most secure facilities in the US government. It's also a very, very tiny space. Now, it's not unusual for presidents to go over to the Pentagon to get a briefing. But this briefing had a special purpose behind it. It was a meeting arranged by Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, uh, Gary Cohn, who's the head of the National Economic Council, and Rex Tillerson. And they had convened this meeting for the president because they had uh, become greatly concerned that six months into uh, his presidency, President Trump didn't seem to be growing, in their view, uh, into the job. But he continued to deny uh, established facts, repeat lots of urban legends, uh, and contested the counsel uh, that he was given by his advisors. Now, they had understood that on the campaign trail, he had criticized the practice of American foreign policy by both uh, Democrats and Republicans, but their hope was that once he got on the job, that he would see some of the wisdom uh, in the policies they had pursued. 
it was clear they had not worked. So essentially, this briefing in a nice uh, July summer day was really sort of a tutorial on American global leadership. Call it American power <coughs> 101. So in this room, the tank, virtually everybody who is anybody uh, in the Trump administration is packed into this room. Uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis kicks off the conversation by basically tipping his hand. And he says, quite ominously, that the greatest gift the greatest generation left us was the rules-based international order. He then turns it over to a bunch of briefers who, uh, in particular, uh, style the Pentagon, go through a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides. Uh, they do it in a way that's designed to address what they took to be the president's main concern. And criticism he'd leveled on the campaign trail. Why did the United States have an outsized role in the world. And as they answered that question, they wanted to sort of explain to him why it was that alliances made sense and still work for the United States, and why America's overseas commitments actually benefited, not just the United States generally, but also created jobs. And they were really trying to address what they took to be the criticisms the president had made on the campaign trail. And for about 45 minutes, the president was a very good student in this tutorial, uh, but eventually his patience wore thin, and as they were going through all the benefits of this rules-based order, the president interjects, this is exactly what I don't want. He then proceeds to get into an animated conversation with his briefers, who grow uh, increasingly frustrated because uh, they see the president as someone who knows far less than he think he does, and he continually interjects to correct them. Uh, they try to correct the correction. And after about an hour and a half or so, the meeting wraps up. The president goes outside, uh, meets with reporters, says uh, very nice things about servicemen and women about the meeting and how good it was. Uh, this meeting was not much remarked upon at the time. It came. Uh, much more famous several months later when NBC News reported uh, that Secretary Tillerson at the conclusion of the meeting said uh, to another colleague that the President of the United States was a, I'll leave out the expletive, moron. Uh, but the more significant <laughs> aspect of this meeting was that Donald Trump fundamentally rejected the practice of American foreign policy as it had been done by Democrats and Republicans over the past 70 years. That he didn't see himself engaged in trying to support or sustain a liberal rules-based order that the American president had created. He was seeking to disrupt it. So that's really the, the fundamental uh, purpose of why we wrote the book and, and uh, the fundamental argument. And I'll, let me tell you a second story kind of gets at a, at a more practical uh, part of his, uh, of his foreign policy. Barack Obama, when he was in office, probably developed the closest and most important relationship with any foreign leader, who was Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel was the chancellor of Germany, the chancellor before uh, 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 President Obama came to office, and continues to be chancellor today, I think, Last I looked, uh, her status is not quite as stable as it used to be. Uh, had emerged in 07 and 08, uh, sorry, in, 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 in uh, 15 and 16, as really a bedrock of this liberal or rules based international order because she had done uh, what uh, leaders around the world. Uh, thought a leader in the world would do. She had opened her borders to uh, many, many, over a million refugees that came in and had made uh, herself as the, as the pronounced leader of the free world, which became more important when what we used to think of the leader of the free world, uh, who sat in the White House in Washington, uh, was the President of the United States, and Donald Trump, who had campaigned fundamentally against this rules-based order, who thought that the rules-based order was, uh, uh, was costing the United States too much, uh, had now come to power. And in the first meeting, really the first 
it was the second or third, but really the first important meeting he had and the White House in March of 2017. Merkel came with the idea, how can I try to get the president to understand the importance of American leadership, the importance of the relationship with Europe, and the importance of how to deal with what she thought was the greatest threat that uh, both countries faced, which was Russia. So she came armed. Uh, in, uh, in, in this meeting, in her, she had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with, uh, with him for about 45 minutes, and she had a map of Europe with an overlay of the Soviet Union. And she tried to explain to him that Vladimir Putin's fundamental goal was to take the Russia of today and make it the Soviet Union of yesterday. Uh, and she had what she thought was a really good uh, conversation. And then, then they had another conversation with A's, which also went very well. Um, one of the uh, people who was there noted that none of the Americans took notes in this meeting. They all, you know, one of the most important things you do in meetings is you take notes. The Americans didn't take notes. And they had a very good conversation. Uh, and then the, they got down to what it was all about, the two things that Donald Trump really cared about, NATO and who pays. <coughs> and the EU, and what is the EU going to do for the United States? And the first question, he said, you know, the EU is a very unfair organization, he told uh, uh, Angela Merkel. It is an organization that really was created by Germany to take advantage of the United States. Uh, and, and she explained that was a little bit more complicated than that. It had something to do with World War II and trying to overcome the differences between Germans and the French. But he said, no, but it's really, you know, it's really it's about taking advantage of the United States and trade deals. And I want to, I want to have a new trade deal. And she said, well, with Germany, I want to have a new trade deal with Germany. She said, you know, unfortunately, we're part of the European Union. We can't have a trade deal uh, directly with the United States. Um, because the European Union is the one who negotiates those deals. And he said, well, but I want to have a bilateral agreement. I don't want to have a multilateral agreement because I lose. It's me against everybody else, and I want to have a bilateral agreement. And she said, well, the EU could have a bilateral agreement with you. He said, oh, great. And he turns to Wilbur Ross and he says, Wilbur, negotiate an agreement with the EU. And so she said, okay, that, that worked out okay. Uh, <laughs> then they turned to NATO. And uh, on NATO, he, he said, you know, you guys are not paying enough for defense. And she said, well, we agreed a few years ago that we were going to increase defense spending and we we're going to reach the 2% level uh, as NATO agreed by 2024. And we're committed, Germany, I am committed as the leader of Germany to get to that level. And he said, well, that's not enough. I want you to do it now. She said, well, we have this agreement among NATO countries and it's going to take some time. It's very difficult in Germany. You know, there's this history. Uh, we used to be accused of invading countries and those kinds of things. So it's kind of hard for us to spend a lot on defense, but I'm, I'm committed to doing it. Uh, and he said, well, actually, I want you to pay us. It's not that you need to pay more for defense. I, you need to pay us because we have been protecting you. And now it's time that you start to pay us back. And she said, well, that's not quite how NATO works. Uh, you know, everybody does their own defense spending. Um, but, uh, but I am committed to paying more for defense. And so she thinks it's, she's explained it, and she walks out. Uh, and just as she's leaving, he turns to her and says, Chancellor, you're terrific, but you owe me a trillion dollars. And the next day, he tweets this out. He said, a great, fantastic meeting with the German uh, 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 chancellor, but she owes me a trillion dollars. And this notion that the, United, that the Europeans owe the United States money for the defense uh, of Europe is central to Trump's perspective that what we do for the world is either for payment or it is, it is to help others, but they need to now start helping us. And America first is to say we are no longer willing to invest uh, in maintaining a global order or in American leadership. We want to make sure that whatever we invest, we get more than our money back. Whether it is in NATO or in trade relations that we have with other countries, 
we need to start taking care of America because for the past 50 years, America has been taken advantage of. That's the, the, the precept that governs uh, America's engagement in the world under Donald Trump's presidency. And it is, and whatever story you can tell, and by the way, there are many more great stories in the book. We haven't given them away uh, yet, so you're still, uh, still a great uh, stuffing, uh, stocking stuffer uh, for uh, the Christmas. Um, but that's the essence, the global rules-based international order that has been defining American foreign policy for 70 years is the problem, and it is time that our allies in particular start paying homage to the United States and making sure that the U.S. comes out ahead in whatever financial terms of that interaction. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, both for that, and thank you for the book, which uh, is uh, is a good read. Um, I uh, imagine that uh, this is a fairly blue audience, not just in terms of chairs, but here we are in Boston, after all. And uh, so I uh, thought maybe I'd uh, just try and make life for you two a little bit difficult. And um, wondering, you talk about uh, his, his notion of winning, and you talk about how we're doing that at the expense of leading. Well, why, why do you believe it's not working? ISIS is, you know, is absent from 98% of the, you know, the stuff in Raqqa and Mosul are, are liberated now. Uh, we have a deal with uh, North Korea. Um, let's see how else. Uh, the jobs and the market look pretty good. Um, so, you know, we're, we're winning. It's working. Should <laughs> <laughs> so I go home now? <laughs> okay, let's unpack it. There's a lot there, okay? Um, uh, the president promised wins, and so I think it's fair to say, does he have wins? I think you're quite right. Uh, if you want to talk about the Islamic State, it has been rolled back territorially, uh, largely by continuing a policy that was adopted by uh, the Obama administration. That doesn't diminish the achievement, but I would also note that that is in some sense incomplete, uh, because the question is, I think you're your, uh, oh, it fell down. That's no, why, it's why I keep making noise. It's part of my touching mic. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to have to go like this because the, the clip is broken. Um, so I will grant you that. But let's just sort of look broadly in terms of toting up uh, the president's win. Let me begin by saying, first off, that if you want to do big picture, you mentioned jobs. The fiscal position of the United States government has deteriorated significantly since Donald Trump came to office. I will note that. Uh, we are on a path that the annual uh, fiscal deficit of the U.S. government will double by next year since the president came to office. I'll note further that by 2022, uh, the United States will pay as much on the interest servicing the national debt as it does on the Pentagon, that by 2028, uh, the United States uh, public debt will be essentially equivalent to the overall size of the U.S. economy. It has never been that high in the history of the United States. Those numbers I just cited to you all assume that we will not have a recession anytime. If you have a recession, all those numbers get bigger much more rapidly. Uh, but let's go beyond that and let's talk about trade deal. The president has uh, negotiated two trade, two trade deals so far. Uh, one being a revision of the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, uh, the other one being a revision of uh, NAFTA, North American free trade agreement, which involves Canada, the United States, and Mexico. I will note that looking at uh, those trade deals, the Korea trade deal was uh, remarkable in the fact that the United States essentially got no significant concessions uh, from the if you want to give me that, I will hold that as well. I will channel my inner Beyonce. Okay, so if you uh, look at NAFTA, and we look at a deal, you have to ask yourself, uh, not did you get a deal, anybody can get a deal. The question is to get a deal, a good deal, at an acceptable cost. What's really remarkable about NAFTA 2.0 uh, is that uh, much of it is actually imported from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This was the trade deal that involved 
the United States and 11 other Pacific Rim countries. Uh, it would have covered 40% of the global economy. It was designed by the and negotiated by the Obama administration, and Donald Trump left it uh, on the third day he was in office. Uh, and he did so without commissioning any strategic review of what it meant to leave it. In many ways, it handed the Chinese a very significant victory uh, by taking the United States uh, out of uh, the economics in East Asia. Uh, and it introduced a number of uh, new provisions, not designed to open up markets, but to actually reduce the American market. It was notably uh, a bunch of rules on domestic auto content. Uh, those numbers all sound really good. Uh, the problem is that in practice, uh, they're likely to lead to uh, undesirable outcomes, mostly by making uh, the United States uh, automobile industry less competitive rather than more competitive, because the fact is the United States is a mature automobile uh, market. Uh, the real market is overseas. And uh, so I don't see that as a particularly significant uh, victory. The president, meanwhile, has left the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, uh, the United States uh, is the only country now uh, not in it. That is, uh, we have sort of an anti-leadership. The United States walked, nobody followed it. Uh, and again, I think climate change is uh, perhaps the most significant long-term threat that we face as a country and uh, as a species. Uh, beyond that, it's really hard to find what the significant wins are. Uh, the president has been more than happy to take questions from the audience and, and walk through them. Okay. Um, I, I have a question for you, unless you wanted to add. No, no, no that's uh, I, the good news about writing together is we agree. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, well, uh, to continue in this vein, um, my question uh, uh, is, is actually um, looking backwards, and I should note that it is inspired by uh, our new friend Luke Caputo, who is a freshman at Emerson, and uh, he's uh, reporting for Boston Common News. So if you're there, Luke, there you go. Um, so, uh, Trump has done these dramatic things that you've mentioned, for example, leaving the, the Paris Accord, um, uh, leaving TPP, etc. But an uh, interesting take that Luke suggests is uh, didn't the Bush and Obama administrations, which, which you served, um, also contribute to the dissipation of uh, the Pax Americana, which after all is our topic? Um, and and how, how were their approaches different and presumably better, in your view? Uh, it's a very important and, and fair question. Um, if you go back and take the Cold War as the Cold War for whatever it was, there were mistakes made during the Cold War, but it was a period uh, in which we had a major threat. We united uh, Western countries in dealing with that threat and ended uh, the threat without, in fact, engaging in conflict with the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and communism, both of which no longer exist. Then look at the next 25 years, and you find that in 1990, the United States emerges out of the Cold War as that Pax Americana, the, uni the true unipolar power, the only country that really can, can determine uh, the future and, and, uh, of international politics, and is bent on doing so. And during the Clinton and, and Bush administrations, uh, and and we, we very much see both administrations, despite the very big differences that exist between them, particularly on methods of how to engage the world. But the overall way in which they thought about uh, America's role in the world was quite similar. It was the belief that we could uh, shape not just the West, as we had done for the past 40 years, but the rest of the world in our own image, both in terms of democracy uh, and in terms of uh, market economics. And we did so in a whole variety of different ways. Some of them, uh, I would argue, uh, were very effective and positive. The attractiveness of wanting to become part of the Western Club opened up both the European <coughs> Union and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to many countries that used to be part of the Warsaw Pact uh, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. They transformed themselves economically, they transformed themselves politically, and became members uh, of the European Union and NATO, thereby strengthening uh, both democracy 
and uh, market-based uh, economics throughout that part of the world. In other parts, we try to accelerate it through the use of military force in places like uh, the former Yugoslavia, uh, and then later on in parts of the Horn of Africa, and of course, uh, most especially under the Bush administration in the Middle East and in South Asia with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. In the fundamental belief that we, through the use of military force, could en entice other countries to follow the democratic and ultimately the democratic, the, uh, the liberal democratic uh, path. Um, we also believe that as we brought people into our global economic system, the global trading system, we would over time find what, uh, help and entice them to liberalize politically. So we would bring Russia into the WTO. We brought China into the WTO. And the belief that over time their economic liberalization would inevitably admit, uh, lead to political liberalization. Those two bets, the bets that we could uh, through the use of military force, transform other societies in a way that was conducive uh, to democracy and, and liberalism, and the idea that if you open up economically, political liberalization would, uh, would immediately follow, those two bets turn out to be wrong. Uh, uh, and uh, they were bets widely shared by Democrats and Republicans. Uh, this is not a neoconservative conspiracy uh, per se. Uh, it was part of the end of history. It was Frank Fukuyama uh, who, who, who argued it, but it was very much part of the enlargement doctrine of the, uh, of the uh, Clinton administration uh, as well. Those two bets turned out to be flawed. We were not able to change the societies through the use of force. In fact, uh, they became quagmires of a new form, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're now in year 18 of our war in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and the uh, security situation is no better, in many cases worse, than it's ever been in that country. Uh, and, in, and in Iraq, although the war is no longer ongoing, the situation is still deeply unstable. And we've seen, in particular with China, that while economic liberalization has proceeded to a major, though not complete uh, extent, political liberalization has, in fact, taken a backseat and has been started to, to reverse. So, under the Bush and, and Clinton administration, the Clinton and Bush administrations, the, the ability to manage and guide the, American, the uh, rules-based order was already waning. Barack Obama came to office in many ways trying to say, so how can we maintain a leadership role even though the rules-based order is framed, uh, and try to adjust as best as can, and as we argue in the book, uh, didn't succeed. Uh, he came out of that uh, uh, eight years of effort in a way with an international system that was, uh, as Donald Trump likes to say, a mess uh, and had a number of major challenges that had been left unaddressed, including China, including North Korea, including an unstable Middle East. Uh, and so every, any president who was going to take go, get into the uh, White House on the 20th of January 2017 would have faced a fundamental problem of how do we engage the world in a way that tries to maintain a sense of international order. Uh, the way that President Trump chose to do so, basically by rejecting an American leadership role in that effort and saying we need to get the best possible deal out of every inter <laughs> bilateral interaction we have, we argue was not particularly effective. That doesn't mean that the problem that he faced wasn't real. Okay, um, I would love to ask many more questions because I have many more, but that's not fair. Uh, so I will um, open up questions. Uh, we have uh, maybe about 20 minutes or so. And uh, don't forget, let your question be a question. With regard to international relations, do you perceive that Trump's uh, viewpoints, attitudes, are from the hip? Does he have advisors around him that subscribe to any of these notions? Uh, the president has very deep-seated views on these issues, particularly on matters related to trade and allies. Indeed, if you were living here in Boston on September 2nd, 1987, and uh, you had read your copy of the Boston Globe very carefully, you would have come across a letter to the American people from a then relatively unknown 
uh, Manhattan real estate developer. Uh, it turned out that that letter to the American people read like a rough draft of Donald Trump's 2016 uh, presidential campaign platform. And the argument was very straightforward. And if you were reading today, uh, change Japan to China, uh, you'd have pretty much the same argument. Essentially, it is Trump's argument that for more than 30 years that what he called in his inaugural address, America's carnage, is because our friends have been free riders on our security guarantee and because they used uh, the notion of American leadership and trade deals as an opportunity to steal jobs from Americans. And in that sense, Donald Trump's answer, his solution, is very simple. Uh, that is, we shouldn't let our allies be a drag on us, and we should get rid of these trade deals. Now, I'm reminded of the newspaperman from the 1920s, H.L. Uh, Mencken, who used to write that uh, for every complicated problem, there is a simple solution, and it is wrong. And I think this applies here to Mr. Trump. Because Mr. Trump's argument, essentially, President Trump's argument, is that leadership is a bad deal for the United States. It costs us far too much. We don't get anything out of it. We really should be about beating our friends and allies. Indeed, what's most striking about the president is when he talks about what would be traditionally friends and allies, he has called them literally foes. Uh, which is quite remarkable. He tends to be harsher in his critique of America's uh, friends and allies, countries whose troops have fought and died alongside Americans uh, over history than he is to uh, countries we typically, typically ascribe as our, our adversaries uh, or our competitors. And as we look at this, I think it's important to understand sort of in, in the president's sense about winning and he's seeking to beat other people. And in some sense, it is a throwback to a mindset that existed in American foreign policy before World War II. This idea that the United States can avoid overseas entanglements and simply has to maneuver to get the best deal for itself. And it's what's interesting about the president's description of the practice of American foreign policy is that it fundamentally misrepresents what it did and how much it cost. The, the, the wise men, the greatest generation who sort of created this international order after the end of World War II, did so not because they were altruists or they were woolly headed or they were sentimental uh, or they just liked foreign countries and wanted to do a good deal. They were trying to solve a very real problem. And the problem was instability and nationalism. Okay? Today is the 99th anniversary of the Senate's rejection of the Treaty of Versailles. It was, in many ways, America's great mistake. Because after World War I, the United States retreated from engagement in the world, and the original America First foreign policy argued that if America stood on the sidelines, it would remain safe and prosperous. December 7, 1941, showed that not to be true. <coughs> So for someone like FDR, Harry Truman, George C. Marshall, Dean Acheson, a long list of people, they were trying to figure out, coming out of World War II, how do you avoid World War III? That was their great concern. And their notion was that if we sort of return to the same geo -com geopolitical competition, dog-eat-dog -dog world, of great powers competing with each other, each having their sphere of influence, we're going to get World War III. What we have to do is think differently. And what they argued for, essentially, was we have to create an order, we can because we're the most powerful country in the world, in which others benefit. And if we can create an order in which others can benefit and do well, we will do well also. And the remarkable thing about that geopolitical innovation, was it's clearly American geopolitical innovation, is that it worked. It produced unprecedented prosperity. That takes us back to the president's calculation about the cost of this order. The president has consistently exaggerated the cost, ignored the benefits. I'll just note on the cost side that here today in 2018, U.S. defense spending as a share of gross domestic product is about 3.5%. When I was a five-year-old growing up in Berwicka, Massachusetts, uh, the United States spent between 8 and 10% of its gross domestic product 
on the military. So the, the cost relative to our income isn't that high. In terms of job loss, the president blames trade agreements over and over again. I'm not going to argue that trade agreements have no effect on employment. But if you want to look at sort of uh, job loss, particularly manufacturing, the number one culprit is technology. It simply takes many fewer people to produce the same amount of goods. And if you don't doubt that, look at a picture uh, of a Ford uh, Motor Company factory floor from 1970 and see how many people are there. Now if you look at it, look in the factory floor, what you see are lots of robots. So the thing is, is that those costs weren't that high. One final point, in terms of having friends and allies, they are force multipliers in dealing with your foes. And one of the great ironies of Donald Trump's presidency is he campaigned by appealing to isolationist sentiment in the, in the American public, even though he himself is not really an isolationist. Uh, he was arguing, and again, you go talked about uh, how our allies had to spend more. But what the president didn't say that our allies have to spend more so that we can spend less. He said, I want the allies to spend more, and I'm going to spend more. I'm going to spend more than anybody else uh, has. And now as president, on issues, we can go through them, perhaps the one most notable, the trade war with China, our friends and allies say, no, we agree with you. We agree that China engages in predatory trade practices. We actually want to help you. What has happened is the president, who derided allies for not doing enough, has turned to the Europeans and the Asians and said, thanks, we don't need you, we got this one. So in an odd way, the champion of America first is positioned in the United States, so it has fewer friends and it does more of the work, and I would suggest that that is, uh, in the long term, uh, doesn't serve America's interests or its values. So lately, there's been this sort of rhetoric of um, a European military as something unique from NATO and unique from all the other bilateral and multilateral security deals. Um, and Trump obviously has taken to Twitter to discuss or to sort of dispel his anger at this development as being uniquely anti-American. Um, but my question is more, to what extent was this, this sort of rhetoric of a European military um, a product of previous administrations, or not even in reaction to an American administration, and how much of it is a reaction to Trump's rhetoric regarding Europe having to step up its commitments to NATO and America? So a couple of, a couple of thoughts on that. Just first, just following up on what, what Jim said, uh, if the idea is that the United States should no longer be paying for Europe's defense, then one would think that the president would welcome the idea of a European army or any effort to increase European defense spending, and he's not. In part because, although it was misinterpreted, uh, the interpretation publicly was that Macron, who was the president of France, who pushed this uh, idea first a couple of weeks ago, uh, was uh, said to have done so because he regarded the United States as a threat. Uh, he talked about the United States as a threat with regard to cyber uh, issues, not because of it was a threat to the military uh, security of, uh, of Europe. But your question raises the larger point. Uh, France has been arguing for a European army since around 1951. Uh, the main reason it's wanted a European army is to constrain the Germans. They didn't have a very good uh, history uh, with having strong German military. Uh, they went to war in for, for, uh, three times in 75 years. By the way, they lost three times in 75 years, uh, and as a result, are, have always looked for a way to constrain German power. And even in, in, in uh, 2018, that is still a thought process in French politics. So that's number one. Number two uh, is that uh, the Europeans are looking for ways to justify more military spending. One way they can no longer do so is to say because the United States has asked us. One thing that Donald Trump has done, uh, uh, has, uh, uh, in, in which way, in, one, one way in which his <laughs> exhortation on the Europeans to do more is backfiring, is it's making it more difficult, particularly in Germany, but in a whole variety of other countries, to justify increases of military spending because Donald Trump is not particularly popular in Europe. What may be a better way to justify increased military spending is saying, this allows us to be more sovereign uh, and, and, and stronger together, which is another reason why 
uh, Angela Merkel just the other day supported the creation of a European army. It makes it easier for her to justify domestically her increases of military spending. Final point, we're not going to get a European army. It's not going to happen uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. It's just very, very difficult uh, for Europeans to uh, completely abdicate their sovereignty uh, and say, we will not be able to deploy our own military forces to do our own, uh, our own missions. And it's particularly impossible for a country like France, which, continue, which is still willing and able uh, to use its military forces and wants to make that decision in Paris and not give Brussels uh, the, uh, the, the right to do that. That said, over time and in the past 20 years, there's been a significant uh, improvement in the way in which European militaries have cooperated. So it is true, for example, that the Dutch and Belgian navies now are almost as one, uh, that the uh, Dutch uh, army and German army are becoming more and more integrated. <coughs> Uh, in fact, the Dutch gave away their tanks because they said, we don't need tanks, we'll do more on uh, investment in naval power because we're going to rely, there's no way we're going to go to war without Germany also going to go to war. So we're going to integrate with the Germans. And that's happening all over Europe. Uh, and uh, that's how you take uh, a precious few euros and dollars and try to start investing them in a way that gives you more and bigger capability. That, and all of those are necessary uh, because there may come one day in which Europe will no longer be able to depend on the United States for its defense. That day may be hastened by the kind of uh, policies and perspectives that Donald Trump has brought to the issue of the relationship with Europe. Okay, so we're gonna do one more short question. <laughs> uh, well, this is another... I'm not a pro-Trump guy, but I'd ask you, um, to what extent do you believe that our guarantee of uh, defense of other countries is not obsolete? We have changes in asymmetric warfare, in cyber warfare, new technologies, rising powers all around the world. How can we possibly be a guarantor in all these locations in the world today? So I would make a distinction between deterrence and reassurance. Our guarantee has both a deterrence element to it and a reassurance element. When we say we will defend you, or we will come to your defense, which is slightly different, others will have to be part of that process, we are telling a potential foe, you need to take account of the fact that the United States may be part of that military engagement, and you don't want to go to war with the United States. You may want to go to war against Estonia, Russia, but you don't want to go to war against the United States. That adds to deterrence. It may not be enough, however, if you're in Estonia, as a reassurance, because you want to be as close to 100% certain that the United States will be there, whereas, to defend you, whereas the Russians don't need 100% certainty, they just need to be 100% certain that the United States won't be there for them to take military action. So if you take that as your construct, the credibility that we have created over 70 years by making very clear who is our allies. By the way, we, we, we have treaty allies, and those are the ones that matter. They're primarily in Europe and Asia and in Latin America. They're, by the way, not in the Middle East. In that sense, Saudi Arabia is not a treaty ally. We don't have a treaty commitment to defend it, uh, although we have an interest, perhaps, to do so. But in our treaty allies, by making clear that this commitment matters and has mattered for 70 years, we add to deterrence. We make it more difficult for countries to challenge the territorial integrity of our, of our allies. And that is ultimately, and this comes back to Jim's point, what this is all about. We're trying to prevent the reoccurrence of war. And if we take away the credibility of our commitment, and if we take away those commitments that we have made, we are more likely to make war more likely. And if that happens, we then have to make the decision, at what point is too much war too much? And we will have to re-engage. That's what happened in 1917. It's what happened and would have inevitably happened 
if not for December 7th, that something else would have happened that in, in, in World War II. And that's the system we've created to prevent it. And by the way, if you look at the economy, the recent economist has a graph of, uh, of war deaths. If you look at the 20th century, we are down to 90,000 people being killed in wars per year when we were at tens of millions at the, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the first part of the 20th century. That is the actual benefit of America making these kinds of commitments. And if we, will, if we forget that creating this rules-based order is fundamentally about our ability not to have to go back to war, then I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to relearn it at extraordinary cost to the United States. Wow. Uh, that is a, a good, if not cheery, place to uh, sum, <laughs> sum up. Avoiding war is not a bad thing. If, no, and, and, and we can also say like it has worked so uh, thus, thus far. Uh, so uh, just to remind you, um, we are about to go upstairs, and uh, we're going to let the speakers go upstairs so they can uh, sign and sell books and mingle with you. But before we do that, we're going to thank our speakers very much for being with us.